Avatar The Last Airbender. It's popular again. Again, uh, with the recent release of the live action, the complete butchering of some of our favorite beloved characters, fans have been revisiting their favorite childhood show. Also, please just let me know how you felt about the live action because I mm, I don't know what to say. Mm, I have thoughts. Mm. Also, Fortnite. Fortnite. <laughs> The gang was put into the Fortnite world, which is just insane. I mean, I talked about how Disney is completely consuming the media market in a previous video, but Fortnite is on this whole other level of consumption. I mean, they are the Pac-Man of our world. They're eating all of your favorite beloved characters and serving them to you for breakfast and putting a little salt on them just for you to consume. Besides that, I mean, you can toast people in Fortnite now. I need you to use the on them. I mean, absolutely burn them to a crisp. You got firebending now. I mean, it's really, it's fun. It's really fun. I'm sure you saw the title and you were thinking, yes, my my OTP. Yes, these two are adorable. Well, this video isn't about that. Please put your dicks away, please. I mean, despite the tension riddled across Avatar The Last Airbender between these two, it serves a singular purpose and that's just bait. Someone had to say it and it's also to contribute to the tension between Aang and Katara. But we're not talking about that. Instead, we're delving into the parallelism of Zuko and Katara's stories here. Katara and Zuko are two characters that are quite distinct from one another, yet also very similar. They have thematic similarities and man, is this show filled with thematic parallels, just like Arcane is, perhaps even more, but I see that this parallel in itself is rarely explored, so how are these two so similar thematically? Let's get into it. And then, bwah. Again, nature, nurture, and circumstance, okay? The three defining factors for any character. Learn it, study it, fucking learn it. Because every time I go into a character, this is exactly what I'm gonna explain and what we're gonna touch upon. So we're gonna explore Katara and Zuko's nurture first. There's a big light. There's a big light in it. That was comically timed. Okay. Stop it, computer. There's a big likeness and contrast in their family life. Zuko was brought up in a castle, which is sweet, but not so sweet, considering the horribly fucking toxic environment the man was brought up in. There was often violence and favoritism towards his sister from his father, but Zuko had his mother to supplement the horrors of his home life. It's not a secret that Katara was also very close with her mother when she was younger. She was raised in a very loving home with very caring and loving parents. Although there is a difference in family dynamic, they still have this connection with their mothers, Ursa and Kia. And Ursa and Kia, similarly, sacrificed themselves. Kia died, and Ursa was banished to save their babies. And that's so beautiful. But on top of that, Ursa and Kia both become positive motivators for both Katara and Zuko. Zuko manifests this in finally standing up for himself and leaving the Fire Nation, while Katara adopts a role of encouragement and nurture for the people around her. Coincidence? I think not! This sort of opposite duality of both of them is a common theme that we see throughout their stories and, well, fire and water are opposites after all, but complementary in some ways. And something that I think is relevant to say is that the water tribes are about unity and community while the Fire Nation strives for strength and power. So their nurture is clearly different and it shows when they show their true nature. And then the nature title card. To start off, their personalities are very similar in terms of their temper. They are both very obstinate and stubborn when it comes to doing what they think is right. I mean, we see it time and time again. But deep down, both of them have a very strong moral compass. And despite Zuko's attempt to push his own kindness away due to trauma and shame, we do know who Zuko really is, while Katara does the opposite. Instead of pushing away goodness, she tries to overwhelm herself with it. She pushes away her anger and grief from her trauma of losing her mother. So they make opposite moves in this regard, but I believe the contrast that this signifies is akin to the difference between fire and water, yada yada, you know what I'm talking about, which is essentially the strongest theme here in the show, but also the balancing factor. Additionally, their tenacity and refusal to stray from their moral code is also very similar thematically and visually speaking. An example of their similar morality is these scenes. When Zuko is punished for speaking out of turn and expresses his discomfort towards needlessly sacrificing a Fire Nation division, he literally gets toasted. He gets toasted by his dad. That shouldn't be f 
Hey, buddy. And despite being ordered to fight by his father, he refuses. Furthermore, that shows his kindness. This similarly happens to Katara. When Hama asks her to take up her work and blood bend to kill more Fire Nation citizens, she sees what Hama is doing as immoral and wrong, and she's disgusted by her actions. She refuses, just like Zuko did. There's another example of their strong wills when they confront their enemies, Zhao and Yanra. Katara's big moment of catharsis comes when she travels alongside Zuko to exert revenge against the man that killed her mother. When they find him, mind you, she was in every right to murder him, but she didn't. She chose mercy because the man was just so f***ing pathetic, actually. Similarly, Zuko strongly dislikes Zhao because he basically tries to steal his thunder. He tried to take his purpose of capturing the Avatar shortly after learning about what he was doing, and because of this, Zuko decides to challenge Zhao to an Agni Kai. That's a duel. And Zuko then pins down Admiral Zhao, and he has the f***ing high ground, but he chooses mercy. They both choose mercy when it came down to facing their enemies, both Zuko and Katara. Zuko and Katara also take on secret identities, and this one's on the nose, but they're influenced by spirits, which is related to both of their natures. But the motivation behind these identities sets them apart. Katara dons the mantle of the Painted Lady, and Zuko becomes the Blue Spirit. I feel that this is noteworthy as a parallel as well, even though their behavior when cosplaying is fucking different. I mean, one went edgy, the other went nice. Pretty different, but also similar thematically. So now let's go on and talk about their circumstance. <laughs> It's time to change the world, people, and bring it to balance. The Fire Nation's aggressive expansion is it is nuts, and it results in widespread conflict and suffering. Their subjugation of literally, literally everyone causes war and tension and conflict within the world. You know the plot of the show. I mean, Katara says it at the beginning of every single episode. Moreover, historical grievances and long-standing animosities between the nations contribute to this sort of cycle of violence, yada, yada, yada. You know it. And their paths in this circumstance are also somewhat reversed in a way, which is super, super cool. Whereas Katara pushes down her rage and grief until the boiling point. I mean, Katara was never able to confront her grief and anger until Zuko sleeping a tent away from her. And that reminder alone was the drop that finally spilled the glass for Katara. Then we get to see her go confront Yon-Ra and deal with that catharsis. While Zuko does embody the rage and grief all the way up to his long-awaited alliance with the Avatar, his circumstance put him in a path of grief and rage. In a way, they are reversed. They symbolize the duality that represents in the story. I mean, it's no coincidence that Zuko is present while Katara seeks revenge. That is her guidance. Then, that subsequent realization of his own and of their similar paths is a parallel in and of its own. And oh, it's so good! So where are we now? They're both dealing with some serious emotional baggage from their past, trying to figure out who they are in the middle of all of the chaos. Zuko's all about finding acceptance and making up for his past mistakes, while Katara's on a mission for justice and trying to heal from the deep wound that the death of her mother left. They're both wrestling their own demons, and they're forming some unexpected bonds along the way with their friends and family. And they show resilience when things get tough, and what? Eventually, their paths do cross, and it's tense, of course. Along the way, they both go through some major growth spurts, learning to let go of stuff that's been holding them back, opening up to empathy, and aiming for a brighter tomorrow. And hey, it's not just about them. Their journeys show us all how powerful forgiveness and compassion can be, even though that does sound a little cheesy, even in the middle of a crazy war. And they prevail or something. I forgot how the show ends. Just kidding. I've seen it like a total of six times. So let's take that as a lesson in character exploration. Uh, so let's just take that as a lesson of character exploration and thematic balance. And write me a good show. I already told you. Write me a good show with good beats. What can I say? It's just written well. It's just written wonderfully. It's beautiful. You see it. I see it. We all see it. And this is why the show has lasted as long as it has and why it's had so many revivals of the story. It's because it's such a gripping take on, you know, conflict in our world and conflict in our society and what happens when, you know, things get out of control, right? Minus the floating bald guy. But honestly, thank you. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. Um... Whatever you're doing tonight, don't forget to invite me. Bye.